Uh, welcome to this video. So in this video series, we're looking at the Divine Presence from William Shittick's book, uh, The Sufi Path of Knowledge, which is basically a systemati systematization of Ibn Arabi's Makkan uh, Fatwat, the Meccan openings, as it's called in English. And he's a translator par excellence and he has the best books out there on the um that are the most authentic that access uh the actual meaning of the and the ulum of the uh perfectly so basically in this series i'm reading his book the call the sufi path of knowledge and it's basically if you want to understand ibn arabi and wahadat al-wajud in detail uh, this is the best book. And right now we're going through the first chapter, which is a sort of overview. And so if you really want to begin understanding um, Wahadat al-Wajud as Ibn Arabi taught it, um, then you really do want to uh, go over this series called The Divine Presence. You can find the playlist uh, probably linked below or at least on my channel. So today's the third video, and we're going to be covering the topic called uh, the Divine Attribute. So I'll begin reading. Allah, the all-comprehensive name, refers to all attributes of being at once. It also alludes to being's relationship with the whole hierarchy of existence that reflects its attributes in varying intensities. A hierarchy that is called in the language of the theologians the acts of God. Now let's read that again. Allah, the all comprehensive name, refers to all attributes of being at once. Here, being is used in a technical sense to refer to the substance of all uh, existent things, including to including Allah. So this is a being here refers to the very substance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, the all comprehensive name, refers to all attributes of being at once. It also alludes to being's relationship with the whole hierarchy of existence that reflects its attributes in varying intensities. A hierarchy that is called in the language of the theologians, the acts of God. Other divine names refer to the refer to relatively specific attributes of being, such as life, knowledge, desire, power, speech, generosity, and justice. According to a saying of the Prophet, there are ninety nine of these most beautiful uh, divine names. Let's zoom out and zoom in here. Divine names. Though other names are expressed or implied in the Qur'an and various prophetic sayings, each name enunciates an attribute of God, sheer being, um, of God uh, who is sheer being. The effect, adhar, or property, hukum of each name can be traced with within existence if that is we are given the insight and wisdom to do so this in fact is the task that ibn arabi undertakes in the futuhat though he is fully aware that every book in the universe would be insufficient to record all the properties of the divine names all the words of god uh, as the quran puts it though all the trees in the earth were pens and the sea seven seas after it to replenish it were ink yet would the words of god not be spent or exhausted as was pointed out earlier the name allah refers to god's essence the name allah refers to god's essence attributes and acts the essence is god in himself without reference to anything else as such uh, God is unknowable to any but himself. He is, as Ibn al-Arabi quotes, constantly independent of the worlds, uh, Quran 397. And this includes the knowledge possessed by the worlds. God as the essence is contrasted with God in as much as he assumes relationships with the cosmos, relationships denoted by various divine names such as creator, maker, shaper, generous, just, exalter, abaser, life giver, slayer, forgiver, pardoner, avenger, grateful, and patient. Okay. In as much as God's essence 
inasmuch as God's essence is independent of the world, the cosmos is not he, but inasmuch as God's essence is independent of the world, the God the cosmos is not he, but inasmuch as God freely assumes relationship with the world through attributes such as creativity and generosity, the cosmos manifests the he. If you examine anything in the universe, God is independent of that thing and infinitely exalted beyond it. He is to employ the theological term that plays a major role in Ibn al-Arbi's vocabulary, incom incomparable, <coughs> Tanzi with each thing and all things, but at the same time each thing displays one or more of God's attributes, and in this respect the thing must be said to be similar, thus be, in some way to God. The very least we can say is that it exists and God exists. Even though the, the modalities of existence may be largely incomparable, <clears throat> many scholars have employed the terms a transcendence and eminence <clears throat> in referring to these two ways of conceptualizing God's relationship with the cosmos, but I will refrain from using these words in an attempt to avoid preconceptions and capture the nuances of the Arabic terminology. <clears throat> you see, this is what I was talking about. He's teaching translation. Um, as he's delivering the content of the translation. And I think it's really important because the type of people who are interested um, in this work of Ibn Arabi are probably going to value that anyways. But just due to the subtleties of the concepts that Ibn Arabi is talking about, it's really beautiful the way William Shittick teaches translation while he's teaching the content of what he's translating. When Ibn al-Arbi speaks about the essence as such, he is in view God. He has in view <clears throat> God's incomparability. <clears throat> in, this, in this respect, there is little one can say about God, except to negate some the attributes of created things from Him. <clears throat> Let's read that again. When Ibn al-Arbi speaks about the essence as such, he has in view God's incomparative incomparability. <clears throat> in this respect, there is little one can say about God except to negate the attributes of created things from him. Nevertheless, the essence is God as he is in himself, and God must exist in himself before he reveals himself to others, both logically and ontologically. Incomparably, Incomparability precedes similarity. In this ultimate reference point for everything we say about God, a, a great deal can indeed be said about him that, after all, is what religion and revelation are all about. A great deal can indeed be said about him that, after all, is what religion and revelation are all about. But once said, it must also be negated. Our doctrines, dogmas, theologies, and philosophies exist like other things, which is to say that they are also they are also are he not he, hua la hua, discerning the modalities and relationships, distinguishing the true from the false, and the more true from the less true, is the essence of wisdom. <clears throat> When Ibn al-Arabi speaks about God's attributes and acts, he has in view the divine similarity. In this respect, many things can be attributed to God, although it is best to observe courtesy, adab, by attributing to him only that which he has attributed to himself in revelation. What he has attributed to himself is epitomized by his names and attributes, the discussion of which the discussion of which delineates Ibn al-Arabi's fundamental approach to the exposition of the nature of things. What he has attributed to himself is ep epitomized by his names and attributes. The discussion of which deline delineates Ibn al-Arabi's fundamental approach to the exposition of the nature of things. The attributes are reflected in the acts. All things found in the cosmos, God's power is reflective passively 
in everything he has made and actively in suns, volcanoes, seas, bees, human beings, and other creatures. His hearing is found in every animal and perhaps in plants as well. His speech is certainly reflected in the cries, calls, and chirps of animals, but only in the same way that a glowing ember may be said to manifest the light of the sun. Only in the human being, the crown of that creation with which we are familiar, can speech reach a station where it expresses intelligence and truth, and in prayer becomes discourse between man and God. Call upon me, says God in the Quran, to men, not to, to monkeys or parrots, and I will answer you. Quran 4060. I think that's a misquote. I don't remember the monkeys and parrots thing, but anyways. Um, for Ibn al-Arabi, the divine names are the primary reference point in respect to which we can gain knowledge of the cosmos. In the Futuhat, he constantly discusses words and technical terms that were employed by theologians, philosophers, and Sufis before him. For example, he has chapters devoted to many of the states, Ahwal and stations, maqamat, that are discussed in the details in Sufi words, which are discussed in detail in Sufi works. These represent the psychological, moral, and spiritual attributes and perspectives that mark degrees of spiritual growth, which travelers on the path to God must experience and assimilate in most cases pass beyond. Examples including attributes that are paired and usually must be actualized together, such as hope and fear, expansion and contraction, intoxication and sobriety, annihilation and subsistence, and other attributes which are <clears throat> and other um, annihilation and subsistence and other attributes which are viewed as marking a kind of ascending hierarchy such as awakening, repentance, self-examination, meditation, ascetic discipline, abstinence, renunction, desire, refinement, sincerity, confidence, satisfaction, gratitude, humility, joy, sorry, um, joy, uh, certainty, courtesy, remembrance, good doing, wisdom, inspiration, love, jealousy, ecstasy, tasting, immersion, realization, and unity. Ibn al-Arbi devotes about 200 chapters of the Futuha to such terminology. The point to be made here is that his characteristic mode of approach is to discuss briefly what previous masters have said about these qualities and then to bring out what he calls the divine root, al-asal al-ilahi, or the divine support, al-mustanad al-ilahi. <clears throat> of the quality in question, what it is about God, Allah, the all-comprehensive reality that allows such a quality to be manifested in existence in the first place and then to be assumed by a human being. In a few cases, the answer is immediately clear. Love is attributed to God in many places in the Quran, so the love that the spiritual traveler acquires must be a reflection of that divine love. But in most cases, the divine root can only be brought out by a subtle analysis of Quranic verses and hadith. But in most cases, the divine root can only be brought out by a subtle analysis of Quranic verses and hadith. Invariably, these analyze. Uh, invariably, these analysis um, circle around the names and attributes that are ascribed to God in the revealed text. It must be concluded from the above a great deal more evidence that will present itself naturally in the course of the present book. It must be concluded from the above and a great deal more evidence that will be pre present itself naturally in the course of the present book that the divine names are the single most important concept to be found in Ibn Arabi's works. Everything divine or cosmic is related back to them. Neither the divine essence nor the most significant creature in the cosmos can be understood without reference to them. It is true that the essence is unknown in itself, but it is precisely the essence that is named by these names. There are not two realities, essence and name, but a single reality. 
The essence, which is called by specific name, is a given context and in a given context and from a particular point of view. A single person may be father, son, brother, husband, and so on without becoming many people. By knowing a person as father, we know him, but that does not mean we know him as brother. Likewise, by knowing in any name of God, we know God, but not necessarily in respect of any other name, nor in respect to his very self or essence. In, in the same way, God's creatures must be known in terms of divine names for any true knowledge to accrue. In the same way, God's creatures must be known in terms of the divine names for any true knowledge to accrue. If every attribute possessed by a creature can be tracked back to its ontological root. God himself, the existence of the creatures, derives from God's being. In the same way, God's creatures must be known in terms of the divine names for any true knowledge to accrue. Every attribute possessed by a creature can be traced back to its ontological root, God himself. The existence of the creatures derives from God's being, its strength from God's power, its awareness from God's knowledge, and so on. Obviously, there are many other attributes in creation than those delineated by the 99 most beautiful names. So the task of explaining the divine root of a thing through language is not at all straightforward. If it were, the Futuhat would fill 100 pages instead of 17,000. However, this may be, it is sufficient for present purposes to realize that the essence manifests itself in the divine names, and the names in turn are revealed through the divine acts. So I'm trying to decide if I want to read this thing. Let's see how long it is in this same video or do it, leave it for next time. So we'll start, um, we'll start this section here, but we may be able to continue in the next video. I'll read some of it probably. We might get to the end if it's interesting. Okay, so the divine acts. The term acts has many synonyms that Ibn al-Arabi is more likely to employ. Though each synonym has its own connotations and nuances, the term acts has many synonyms that Ibn al-Arabi is more likely to employ. Though each synonym has its own connotations and nuances that can only become clear when it is explained in detail and employed in context, acts are found in the intermediate domain known as existence. So their state remains forever ambiguous. Acts are found in the intermediate domain known as existence. So their state remains forever ambiguous. To what extent they reflect the light of being is always at issue. The word acts itself the word acts itself implies their existence since the acts pertain to the divine presence and by the definition and by definition god is sheer being in a similar way the synonyms um the synonym term creatures khalq makhlukat demands that the acts be the result of the activity of the divine name creator khalik whose business is to bring things out from non-existence into existence. Here also the term emphasizes the light of being reflected in the things of the cosmos. Another common term applied to anything in the, co in the cosmos is form, surah. As Ibn al-Arbi says, there is nothing in the cosmos but forms. But the term form normally calls to mind a second reality which the form manifests. But the term form normally calls to mind a second reality which the form manifests. X is the form of Y. This section, this second reality is often called the meaning, mana of the form. At first sight, the term existence, mojudat, clearly affirms the reality of the created things. At first sight, the term mojudat, clearly existence, clearly affirms the reality of the created things, but a more careful analysis makes it ambiguous. Since existence itself stands in an intermediary situation, never, nevertheless, we can contrast existence with non-existence, madumat, mojudat and madumat, in which case a clear distinction must be drawn. Here the point is that there are degrees of partition in the light of being. 
those things that are existent can be found in the outside world through our senses, but those things that are non-existent cannot be found. However, they are not pure nothingness, since non-existence is an ambiguous ca category not too much different from existence. The non-existence of the things is clearly a relative idafi matter. For example, a person may claim that galaxies are non-existent, and in relationship to his understanding, this may be true st a true statement. On another level, your fantasies are non-existent for me, existent for you. On the cosmic level, any creature which can be found in the outside world is existent as long as it continues to be found there. But when it is destroyed or dies or decays, it ceases to be found in the original form, so it is non-existent. Any creature that God has not yet brought into existence is also non-existent, though it certainly exists in some mode since it is an object of God's knowledge. It is found with God. He knows that he will bring it into the cosmos at a certain time and place, so it exists within him but is non-existent in the cosmos. Ibn al-Arbi employs the term object of God's knowledge, malumat synonymously with the term non-existent thing. Both terms denote things or creatures as found with God before or after they have existed in the cosmos. However, it needs to be kept in mind that these things never leave God's knowledge, so everything exists in the cosmos at this moment is also non-existent object of knowledge is also a non-existent object of knowledge. Here again, its situation is ambiguous. One of the more common and probably best known terms that Ibn al-Arabi employs for the non-existent object of God's knowledge um, is immutable entity. Is immutable entity. In Thabitha. In, in Thabitha. Immutable entity. Entity here is synonymous with thing, she, and thing as, sh as should be apparent from the way I have been employing the term all along is one of the most indefinite of the indefinites. Min ankar al-nakirat, min ankar al-nakirat, since it can be applied to anything whatsoever, existent or non-existent, though it is not normally applied to God as being. The existent things are the creatures of the cosmos, though never ceasing to be non-existent objects, though never ceasing to be non-existent objects of God's knowledge. The non-existent things are objects of knowledge also called the immutable entities. The non-existent things are objects of knowledge also called immutable entities. These things or entities are immutable because they never change just as God's knowledge never changes. He knows them for all eternity. Here, of course, we enter on to the very slippery ground of free will and predestination, one of Ibn al-Arabi's favorite topics. When discussing wujud, the central concern of the Muslim uh, per Peripatetic, I can't say that. Peripatetics, such as Avicenna, Ibn al Arabi often borrows the peripatetic, peripatetic term wajibul wujud, necessary being, that which by its very nature is and cannot be. This is what we have been referring to been referring to as being. In this context, the entities are called the possible things. Mumkin, mumkin, what is it called? Mumkinat. Since they may or may not exist in the cosmos, in respect to their own possibility, which is their defining characteristic, their relationship to existence and non-existence is the same. An immutable entity is a non-existent possible thing. An immutable entity is a non-existent possible thing. If God gives preponderance darji, to the side of existence over non-existence, it becomes an existent entity. An, an existent possible thing, like entity and thing, like entity and thing, and unlike existent, the ontological status of a possible thing has to be specified. 
these few words that are employed in various contexts as synonyms for the term acts all share a certain ambiguity in terms of their reference. To repeat this is because they are used to describe the domain of existent things. These few words are employed in various contexts as synonyms for the term acts all share a certain ambiguity in terms of their reference. To repeat this is because they are used to describe the domain of existent things which is ambiguous by nature, only being the necessary being, only being the necessary being, wajibul wujud is absolutely unquestionable and unambiguous, but since it is utterly free of every limitation that can be applied to anything else, we can only know it by negating from it all the ambiguity of that which is other than being. Things immutable, uh, things immutable entity, existent entities, acts, creatures, existence, non-existence, possible things, and anything else can name are in themselves not he. This is what might be called God's radical transcendence. He is utter and absolute incomparability from this point of view. True knowledge of God can only come through negation. This is the classical position of much of Islamic theology, but however essential and true, it must be complemented in Ibn al-Arabi's view, which is the acknowledgement that the acts do possess a certain a derivative actuality and existence all the more so since we are situated in their midst and cannot ignore them. Everything other than God is not He. Everything other than God is not He. Which means that everything other than God is not reality, not being, not finding, not knowledge, not power, etc. Nevertheless, we do find the effects of these attributes in the existent things and thus let's, let us know what he, that He is present. And this lets us know that he is present. We are nearer to man than the jugular vein. Whether Wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. Okay, so we're going to end there um, in this video. Um, I think he's perfectly clear. It's, it's insane how clear he is in his writing about these topics. Reading him again after a few years, I just feel struck by how easy it is to remember um, or what he what I learned before and how easy it is to understand him again after so many years and just to understand all of Ibn Arabi's thought. If you're not understanding these videos, it's because he's using technical terminology as he's already defined it in previous sections of the book and previous uh, video uh, videos that I've already uploaded. So I'm also not taking the time to explain each term again as he uses it because it's already explained in the previous videos and that would be cumbersome to viewers who want to watch or listen to the whole book, right? So if you're not understanding these videos, it's because you haven't understood the technical terminology discussed in the previous videos. So in the upcoming videos, so let me just go over the sections. I feel like this is a good place to uh, mention like the the development of the introduction introductory chapter, the overview chapter. So he next time we're going to look at the macrocosm and um, the microcosm. So in the next next video we're going to look at the macrocosm and the microcosm but let's go to the and then today we looked at the divine acts before the divine acts we looked at uh the divine names before the divine names, we looked at being and non-existence and before being in non-existence we looked at finding god right so you can see there's a logical development where he's clarifying terminology and then starting to use it in the in the future sections so it doesn't make sense to clear and he's very clearly defining and explaining the terminology before he begins to use it without explanation so it wouldn't make a lot of sense to um re-explain it in every single section right so i recommend that you go back and you listen to the videos that we've already done and as you or or just go here and uh, read 
uh, read his own words. You can read it yourself if uh, listening to it isn't making sense. But once you know the vocabulary of each section, you understand each section, it's much easier to understand the future section uh, that, that we're going through. And he's very clear. He does a good job. Anyways, that's it for today. I'll talk to you soon. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.